set you off with a, a story. Um, you know that a few last week before last, some of us went to the Link Conference, and John Maxwell was the speaker there, and he told this story, and um, Carol Norman asked me to tell it, so I'm gonna tell it today. Here we go. Um, on the very first day, it's called, it's called a man's life. On the very first day, God created the donkey. He said to the donkey, today I have created you. As a donkey, you must go to the field with the farmer all day long. You will work all day under the sun. I will give you a lifespan of 50 years. But the donkey objected. What? What kind of tough life you want to give me? For, you want me to live for 50 years doing all this work and all this toil? Let me have 20 years. And the 30 years, I'll give back to you. So God agreed. On the second day, God created the dog. God said to the dog, what you are supposed to do is to sit all day by the door of your house. Any people that come, you will have to bark at them. I can attest to that, by the way. I'll give, I'll give you a lifespan of 20 years. The dog objected. What? All day long to sit by the door? No way. Give me back another 10. Give me back my, I'll give you my other 10 years of life, so you give me just 10 years. So God agreed. On the third day, God created the monkey. He said to the monkey, monkeys have to entertain people. You have to make them laugh and do monkey tricks. I'll give you 20 years lifespan. The monkey objected. What? Make them laugh? Do monkey faces? Do silly things and tricks? 10 years will do, and the other 10 I'll give back to you. So God agreed. On the fourth day, God created man and said to him, your job is to sleep, eat, and play. You will enjoy very much in your life a lot of things. All you need to do is enjoy and do nothing. This kind of life, I give you a 20-year lifespan. The man objected, what? Such a good life? Eat, play, sleep, do nothing, enjoy the best, and you expect me to live only 20 years? No way. Why don't we make a deal? Since the, cow gave you, or since the, since the donkey gave you back 30 years, the dog gave you back 10 years, and the monkey gave you back 10 years. I'll take those years from you. That makes my lifespan 70, right? So God agreed. And that's why in our first 20 years, we eat, sleep, and play, enjoy the best and do nothing much. For the next 30 years, we work all day long, suffer and get suffer to get support, support the family. And for the next 10 years, we entertain our grandchildren by making monkey faces and monkey tricks. And for the last 10 years, we stay at home, sit by the front door, and bark at people. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> now you know why people are like they are, right? <laughs> oh, you're in that 10-year segment of life. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to get moving here. Um, today, we're starting a new series, Out of the Cave. And um, um, this is the thing that I want us to be able to do is to step in the cave of depression, in the cave of darkness, to be able to step into the light when depression darkens what you see. The whole idea of studying about depression, as I said last week a little bit, came to me um, a couple years ago because a large number of people that, that I come in contact with personally, and some of them are here and some of them are other places in the community, and, and, and people who are just awesome people, but they're battling depression. You know, and some of them, you wouldn't even know that they're battling this depression. You wouldn't even know those things are happening. And over the years, I've been wondering, why? Why is this happening to so many people? What's going on? Why do so many good people battle with this thing? There are many people who have a great job. There are people I know, you know, that have good life, good family, great ministry. They're doing a lot of awesome things. But what we don't always know is the battling depression. And every now and then I'll have someone say, well, you know, I'm on antidepressants or I'm take, I'm, I battle depression or I have, you know, and I'm just going, wow, I, didn't, I would never have known that. I would never have seen that in people that they're doing this. So um, I've also wondered, what about the spiritual side of all this? What are we doing with that aspect? So I've decided to take the leap and talk to you about something I know nothing about. <laughs> so, how's that? And maybe this will help some of you. Maybe, maybe this will help some of you who don't battle depression, but you can give something, take something back to a friend, a family member, or somebody else that does. 
Um, what's difficult for me, as I said, I don't, I don't have this battle. And so, you know, when things are looking, things are looking good and things are going great and somebody just, you know, just is not up to par. Somebody is, is looking down and, and I'm one of these guys that when somebody's down and blue, hey, you know, I, I don't necessarily say it. I'll just be honest. Sometimes I think it. Hey, come on, let's go. Things are looking great. Let's go. Get up. Get up. Go. Cheer up. Things will be better, you know. And that's and some of you probably do that when you have somebody that's blue and down. You, you think that at least, or maybe even say it, you know. And that's just not very helpful for people who have this battle. Um, it, it's it's uh, actually we can slight people. When we do that, when we when we say those things, people who are depressed, they have and we have this attitude toward them, or or what may be causing their depression and anxiety. We can be sliding it, and that's just really not helpful in the whole thing. And what I realized is that for most people in this battle, just cheering up isn't that easy. Just saying cheer up, it's not that easy. Most people don't know how they got into the cave of the depression, let alone getting out of the cave of depression, like that commercial where people put on this, this smiley face in front of them. You know, you know, you've seen the commercial and yeah, it's a drug commercial, but it spoke to me because people have this smiley face, they're going along and on the backside, they're, they're down. So we, we fake it, right? We make it look good. We, we fake it till we make it, right? We're gonna look good, right? That just doesn't work. In 2018, there were um, several pastors who had committed suicide. Notable pastors in America have committed suicide and um, four in just a couple months. You know, when a pastor commits suicide, it's like, what, I, I remember distinctly one young pastor, beautiful family out of California, young kids, boom, out of the blue. It's like, what's going on? And they found out he was battling depression. Robin Williams, actor. I mean, would you think Robin Williams battled depression? I mean, what, fake it till you make it, right? He looked good, so good, but it was a battle he had. And so, so many people do this. And when I heard about these suicides, I thought, something's not right. So from then on, I really worked at keeping my ears to the ground, so to speak, when it came to depression. And then, you know, 2020 hits, right? COVID-19 hits, you know, and everything just kind of bleh. So I was looking, um, doing some research, and according to Mental Health America, anxiety increased from January to September of 2020 by 93%. Depression rose by 62%. And I think to different degrees, we all experienced some sort of anxiety or depression last year, right? We all, you know, whether it's this or that or whatever. And I also heard that mental health hotlines had a 900% increase in call and text volumes last year. And I tried to confirm that number, and I wasn't able to actually confirm that number. But even if that, even if that number wasn't 900%, even if it was just 10%, a 90% increase would be huge, right? So something was happening. And, and we've heard that in Eastern UP, the, the calls, the mental health hotline, the suicide hotlines, and stuff like that, were just phones were ringing off. We got the numbers back, and they were just incredibly high. The CDC said that one out of four young people under the age of 30 considered suicide in 2020 and one of 10 for the rest of us. Divorce filings went up 20%. Antidepressant medication last year rose 300%. Folks, I believe that this is an epidemic, and I believe that it's, it's something that the world's not going to solve. It's something that the church and God need to solve and that we need to be a part of this. Amen? We need to get going on this and we need to have a voice in what is happening in here. Not just allowing science and biology and, and all that stuff to take over. I think we need to be part of this. So today I'm going to start talking about how, how we get into the cave. This week and next week I'm going to talk about getting into the cave. And this first part of this message is just my introduction. Okay, just Tim's introduction to the whole thing and trying to get there. So I don't know how far I'll get. Uh, you have notes and these notes will continue on for next week. Um, but before we get into the Bible, there's two observations I want to use as qualifiers. First, I want, to, I want to qualify by saying that there's some real biological issues that people have, reasons for depression. Okay, I don't want, I don't want you to think that Tim's going to say none of it's biological, none of it's genetics or anything like that. It, so it's not just about 2020 or 
C19, but there's some genetic and biological issues that happen in our mind, okay? I want to be clear about that. But if we allow science and biology to, to dominate the entire conversation, we'll miss some real solutions that are out there. And we have some of those real solutions. Jesus has those, some of those real solutions. One of the things that we need to get is that depression, here's your notes, is not a malfunction of the mind, it's a signal. So many people think that it's a malfunction of the mind, but it's a signal, okay? It's a signal that we have. You know, like um, last week one day, I, got, I had a really bad headache for a day. And of course, Kathy said, you take a pill for it? And I said, no, I'm not a pill taker. I'm not a, I don't do a lot of that. But really, for me, it was a signal that I was tired, I was overworked. I was stressed for that day. And so it, it, it was a, just a signal for me, right? It is how it manifested itself in a, in a headache for me. The next day I was, I was fine and everything's fine. So it, it's, it's de- trying to tell us something. There's some other things that we could possibly address um, to help us get out of the cave of depression. So it's a, it's a signal for us. The second is that the, there's a real stigma around the topic of depression. And most of you know that I wear hearing aids. Now, some of you might say, Tim, you're not walking in faith or whatever, you know. And I wear hearing aids. Why? Because my ears aren't functioning properly anymore. And so I need something. And my hearing aids, I have, a, I have an app. So when you, see me, when you see me get this out and stuff, I'm changing my hearing aid. I got an app that's on my phone. So I don't you think I'm Facebooking. Oh, who's here? You know, uh, Facebook Tim is with, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on the app. So I have music app. I have this app. So well, my point is that you wouldn't think less of me for not wearing the hearing aids because it helps me to function and do things better, correct? And, and it's the same thing with people who are struggling in their mind. You know, we should be embracing correctly our condition and listen to me. It doesn't have to be your or my or our identity. Illness is not my or your identity. So many people are now identifying because they have depression. They have something wrong with them. And, oh, I'm, I battle depression. And, and that becomes their logo. That becomes their, their mark. And then they're, they're just, that's what they go by. They're living by I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. And, and I'm going to tell you what. For me, if you keep going Eeyore syndrome, you know, oh, poo. It'll never work, poo. You know, boy, that can be depressive by itself. You know, it's just some, so some of those things feed. What you're feeling is not who you are. It's just what you're struggling with in that moment. And wouldn't it be great if the church was a leader in addressing these issues? Wouldn't it be great? I, th- I think it would be absolutely awesome. So this week, the other day, I was with someone and um, coming back into town and I see this guy standing here at the, at, at the pavilion. And he's got a cross, and he's got a sign. And I couldn't quite make the sign, but I saw depression or anxiety or something on the sign. I had to turn, and I, I went and had to take this person home and had to do some other things. By the time I came back around, the person was gone. And uh, but Kathy managed to, to – she's curious. No, she's just – no, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Finally, the pastor's telling us the truth. <laughs> That's what you think, right? <laughs> she's just flat and nosy. <laughs> you know, she's look, reading my text messages. She's on my phone. She's, she's just nosy. I married a nosy, nosy woman. Anyway, and, and, and maybe they're all that way. I, I, don't want, I don't want to get... I might get in trouble. I'm looking at faces, looking at me like... I know, my next pizza's going to be rotten, right? So, anyway... Um, I love her. <laughs> Does that help? <laughs> I told Tim. Tim was up here. Tim was up here, and Tim did a great job this morning, didn't he? Yeah, he did a great job. I, and he wasn't like um, Tim Darknell at Rexton when he first did it the first time. He was literally. I'm. I'm. I'm not exaggerating. He was just doing. <laughs> nah, you weren't too bad, really. I, I just thought it was a tap dance. Um, so you know, Tim was. I told Tim, quit digging. Take the shovel away from her. Yeah, we're, so we're in the same hole. Okay, so anyway, so uh, Kathy went and talked to this gentleman and then set up a meeting with him and I, Searle, Searle, Searle. 
Everybody say Searle. There you go. There, that's his name. Searle, come on up here. And uh, I asked Searle just to share a little bit what he is doing. And we got the red mic. Uh, and I asked him to just give him a few minutes here and, and share what's, what he's doing, um, why he's doing it. Searle is from Kinross and uh, feels a calling. So go ahead, please. So you might be wondering, well, why do you feel comfortable wearing out there, but not in here? Well, that, that's kind of one of the reasons we came up with that red helmet. And so, uh, whether you know it or not, I'm sure you do, living in an Auburn way, there's a, there's a, I'd say considerable, but it can't be that considerable, but pretty much probably the entire town, town population is in here now. But there's a considerable native population in Auburn way, as all around the Upper Peninsula. And Native Americans, Most, most natives, Métis, like French, French Indians, most of us are Métis, um, most of us are Catholic. Um, and so we all, we all know the history of the, of the boarding schools and, and, and the U.S. government involvement for Native Americans. And for many people, that's history. Um, but for most Native Americans, it's, it's painfully relevant. Um, so as I discussed with Pastor Tim here yesterday, shocked the way to put it, I'm, I'm not going to put it the way I did him, but um, the Jesus that most Native Americans met was not a kind man. Um, right? So, uh, that is kind of one of the reasons that I'm out here dressed in my ribbon shirt, it's called ribbon shirt, as you, you didn't know, uh, this is actually the shirt I graduated in from a tribal college. Ironically enough, um, I was the only one dressed in a ribbon shirt. I face painted and I was dressed in a ribbon shirt. And I had a friend uh, who's a Chickasaw Indian. And he's like, yeah, I was like, man, that's great. He's looking around and he's like, well, what, why, why are you the only one? And I'm like, I don't know. I guess I'm the weirdo. He says, no, no, you're, you're actually the normal one. He's like, you all should be dressed this way. This is your heritage. This is your culture, right? And I'm not here to bandstand any heritage or culture. I'm just simply saying that So, um, if you don't mind, um, I, I just have a few scriptures mm -hmm. I'd like to read. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. May I utilize yep. that? Yep, go right up here. So, thank you so much. Uh, when I was asked, um, now basically, who are you? <laughs> who are you? Uh, and the word, the, word, uh, the word kook was bandied about, not by Pastor Tim, but I've heard it a couple times. Is he a kook? Um, well, I, I met the, uh, Dale St. Andre. Spent some time with him, uh, and, and he says, "You know, if you're a kook, we all are, because I don't, I, I, I don't believe anything quite different than, than any other Christian, right? And uh, if if one were to analyze our faith honestly, it is a little kooky. You know what I mean? I mean, we believe in a guy that came down from heaven." Once we really start digging, we're kind of weird, and that's the way God intended it. Right? We're not supposed to look like the world. That's the whole point. So the scriptures that I wanted to share today with you, um, John the Baptist came and, uh, came preaching, uh, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And they're like, okay, I'm John the Baptist. But the Pharisees sent some people to ask him, who are you? Are you the Christ? No, I'm not the Christ. Are you the prophet? Elijah? Nope, not Elijah. So who are you? Because we need to give an answer back to the people who sent us. Basically what they were asking John is, what authority do you come in? And John's answer was, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And so 
no, I, I don't think I'm that guy. But I really like what John did there is he took from the scripture and he basically just said, listen, I'm just fulfilling the scriptures that were written. That's all I'm doing here. I'm just fulfilling the scriptures that were written specifically about me. But it was it was God's authority that I come in. And so I just have a few scriptures um, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first scripture that I'm fulfilling is the Great Commission. Right? Go and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations. Um, and not that Native Americans dress like this. This is a ceremonial garment, right? This is a ceremonial garment. You probably haven't seen many of any Native Americans wearing red shirts. Perhaps you have, but typically we only wear these during uh, our ceremonial uh, events. Um, the second scripture um, I wanted to, to cite is um, Matthew, well, the first part of Matthew chapter 16, right? Uh, those who believe in me will, these signs will follow them. So uh, the sign that I'm holding actually says uh, depression and addiction cured here. And there's an arrow pointing to the foot of the cross, right? So that's really where all ailments of this world are cured is at the foot of the cross. Right? That's where they're cured. And so I'm believing, um, and th this isn't at all to detract away from Pastor Tim's message. Um, I, I like it so far. So, um, I do believe that knowledge and process, okay, is essential to any type of growth, including coming out of the gate of depression. But I can testify to you, when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, I was supernaturally delivered of alcohol, drugs, suicide, depression, pornography, gone. One day, so gone. So, I'm telling you that Preach to the choir, literally. Um, the power of God is real to deliver. Amen. And some people need that. Some people need, uh, well, the, the last scripture, actually, that I, that I wanted to share is, uh, I think I got this wrong, I thought, I thought uh, it's Paul said this is the Thessalonians, it wasn't the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 2 5. He said um, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of is it not true that we can empty the cross of Christ of its power through the wisdom of men? Is, is that not what the Bible says, right? He says that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And that is the actual present power of God in your life to deliver you supernaturally from your current circumstances. God doesn't work like that all the time, amen? He doesn't. We know that. We're Christians. Live the life long enough now to know that God doesn't always supernaturally intervene, but sometimes He does. Amen. And so, those are the scriptures that I wanted to send or, or, or to share. Um, my name is Cyril Allard. Um, that part of my life, and Pastor Tim here knows pretty much the condensed version in detail of who I am, where I came from, my, you know, my struggle. My name is Cyril Allard. I come from Kitchlow. I'm carrying that sign across the Upper Peninsula to every Native American reservation to hold it and to and to uh, hold out salvation specifically for addiction and depression uh, believing that if, if people will come to the cross and allow me to pray for them that God's going to supernaturally deliver them from depression and or addiction so that they might know that there's a God in heaven and his name is Jesus Christ so to that end please pray for me please pray uh, against uh, the demonic forces Thank you, Cyril. I, I don't believe there's an accident that Cyril was out there and that he had the sign and he's a sign that he's doing. And I just think it's awesome that 
He, he's following the calling of God. Some people think, oh, yeah, he's nuts. He's crazy. But it's like I said, you know, in the world, we're so different. We're the fish swimming upstream, and we're supposed to look different from the, from the rest of the world, and we do. So I just think it's great, and we're going to keep you lifted in prayer uh, on that. Uh, so I want to give you getting... I want to give you the end before the beginning here. So this is still part of my introduction. Um, and this is simply like what Searle said. God wants you to be free. God wants you and me to be free. God doesn't enjoy seeing us struggle at all. For people who say that, well, this is my lot in life. This is what God's called me to. This is what he's given me. Listen, I don't believe that. I personally don't believe that. Um, I really believe that you can know God and you can find freedom and discover your purpose and you and it can make a difference and you can make a difference where you're at. But that doesn't mean we still don't struggle with things, but God wants you free. I want, in fact, I want everybody to read this scripture passage with me from Galatians 5.1. Let's read it together. Okay, ready? Read. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. I didn't write that. That's in your Bible. And so, so, you know, you can find that. It's for freedom that Christ set us free, and God gave Jesus that power because he, what Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be what? Free indeed. So, so if people, you know, you've got to get that. You've got to understand that we want to be free. God is the answer. Jesus is the answer. He's called us to freedom. He's called us to be free, to set our lives free. Free, yes, we can set our lives for free from sin. Yeah, I get that for salvation. Yeah, we do, we do, right? We want that. But free from, free from the bondage of, of disease, free from the bondage of our mind, depression, anxiety, free from all those things. Uh, and even the best of us struggle. Um, and, but you know, the Bible, the Bible isn't a book written about perfect people. How many know that? <laughs> it's not written about perfect people. Ever notice that God seems to use some of the worst people? He uses adulterers. He uses murderers. He uses uh, uh, prostitutes. And yes, even depressed people. You know, when I look at the Bible, I see him. One of the, one of the persons in the Bible that comes to me in the Old Testament is the prophet Jeremiah. Yeah, Jeremiah, he wrote the book um, Jeremiah, but he also wrote an entire book on depression called Lamentations. Right? Anybody read Lamentations recently? <laughs> just recently? I mean, it's just not a fun book to read. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a, oh man, it's a gloom, despair, and agony on me. Oh, you've got to be certain age to understand where that song came from. Hee haw, right? <laughs> Anybody, who remembers that? Who remembers? All right, the rest of you need to go back and look at reruns because it's, it's good. That's back when good TV was good TV. Okay, so anyway, so um, he wrote this, but look at this. He says, he says this. I have been deprived of peace. You ever felt that way? Peace is gone. I have forgotten what prosperity is. In other words, nothing in my life is working. My marriage, my job, my family, nothing is working. My kids, I don't even know what success looks like anymore. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. So even, even when I ask God for help, he's not helping. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. This is not good thinking. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Well, I guess it is, Jeremiah. If you're going to sit around and you're going to be thinking about this all day, that's what's, that's what's going to happen. And, and so my point is, this even happens with prophets. Prophets of God battle depression. Let's go to the New Testament. Even the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he said this. He said, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction. So I want, you, I want everybody to know the problems, the struggles that I've had, that we've had in this channel, which came to us in Asia. Some translation versions say Asia Minor. So, so I want you to know all the struggles that we had along the way, the afflictions we had. Now look at this. It says that we were burdened how excessively, how much, how excessive, beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life. 
So, so here's the great apostle Paul. First we have a prophet in the Old Testament. Now an apostle saying, I don't think I can take this. This is too much. Does that sound like depression? So the story I want to look at today starts with the great prophet um, Elijah, uh, possibly the greatest prophet in all of history. He's one of the men that was at the transfiguration of Jesus when Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the mount. And it wasn't called the Mount of Transfiguration then. It was called that. <laughs> we use that now. But, but so my point is that if, if God shows up with Elijah, with Peter, with, with God, Moses, and Elijah, then Elijah was, um, was elevated by heaven to be there with Jesus. And that was an important position that Elijah would show up. So he is a man of prominence in the heavenlies. He's a man of prominence on the earth with the things he did. And he actually, Elijah was someone who struggled with depression. And I want you to notice that his depression seemed to happen after his greatest victories. His, it, it happened after his great, in fact, some of the best, best preaching material is in 1 Kings chapter 18. There's great stories. Elijah, he, in one story, he, if you know this, know about Elijah, he defeats the 850 prophets of Baal and the Asherah. And, and he calls, he has this dueling match with him, right? And so in the afternoon, he puts an um, altar together, and he, he floods it with water, and he prays to God, and God's fire comes down and licks it all up and takes the water, takes the altar, takes everything away, and then he, he puts the prophets of Baal and Asherah to death with the sword. And after that, it, God had had to cause a drought for three years. Elijah prays, the drought ends, he outruns um, Ahab on a chariot and horses, and he girds up his loins and he outruns them. So he had these victories going on. But it's after those spiritual victories, you would think that he'd be having a party. You'd think he'd be, he'd be celebrating the good news and all that God has done. But here's what happens next. Now Ahab, that's the king, told Jezebel, that's the queen, all that Elijah had done, okay, and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah. Uh, I, I, what I want you to get before I get into this is um, sent a messenger to Elijah saying, I want you to get this, that she sent a message. She sent a threat. She didn't send someone to kill him. Okay, is this the message? This is a bad comment on your Facebook page, right? So she sends this message, not even somebody to kill him, and Elijah can't handle that. He can't, you know, he, he stood up to 850 prophets, he, he prayed for the drought to end, he outran Ahab, he did all those things, and she just sends a message. She does, just sends a threat. She doesn't send a murderer, she doesn't send a sniper, she doesn't send anybody like that. She just sends the messenger, and look at this, saying, so may the gods do this to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So this is a comment on Elijah's Facebook page, and he's freaking out about it. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba. I want you to understand something about Beersheba. I'm not going to get into it real far, but Beersheba is where Elijah got his calling. Beersheba is, so Elijah runs back to where he got his calling, right? And he gets his calling from there, and it's at that place, he says, God, I don't think I can do this. He went back to the place and said, God, I thought you were on my side. He went back to his calling, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. That's not a good idea to leave your servant there, but he does it anyway. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And came and sat under a juniper tree to get shade, to moan, to bemoan, and all that. And he requested for himself that he might die. He prayed a prayer that a lot of people have prayed. God, I'm just done with this. God, take me now. And said, it is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. I'm not sure why you put that in, but he put that in. And we see in this story six things that he gets that gets him into the cave of depression. He goes into the dark place. A cave, in my mind, is a is a good description of what depression feels like. Because we know there's a way out, we just don't know where it is. 
It's disorienting. It's dark. It's lonely. If you've got depression, you battle with depression, you probably understand what I'm saying best of all. You can feel some things in the dark, but you don't know really what you're feeling, right? And you know in a cave, there's bats in there. It's not a good place, right? Can I go on bats? And so again, I, I fully understand that I am not there. But some of you are and have been, and there, there is a need for counseling or medication. Sometimes that is an answer. You need to get that to, to get things together. There are people who need medication, help with the, the wires have been broken in the mind. And we need some medication to help put the wires back together in the mind. So still treatment to me. We, we, so how many know we, we work like it depends on us when it comes to life, and we pray like it depends on God? So what we need to do is understand that there are some factors that we have control over and which should give us some great hope. So I'm going to share over today and tomorrow six things. Today, I'm not going to get all six today, but um, over this, this next week, and I'll give you uh, over this week six things, and then I'll give you five things the last two weeks. It's a four-week series. The last two weeks to get out of the cave. Six things that get us into the cave. Five things that get us out of the cave. Okay, here we go. Here's number one. Ways we get uh, enter the cave. One, life imbalances. Life imbalances. Johan Hari wrote, in, wrote the book, Lost Connections, Undercovering Real Causes of Depression and Unexpected Solutions. And he says that we need to stop talking as much about chemical imbalances and more about imbalances in the way we live. And more and more research is pointing to our lifestyles as the main factor and causes for depression. Notice, Elijah's depression came after his two greatest experiences. Here's what I've noticed in my life that happens. I have more attacks from the enemy and more of my worst thoughts from the enemy after my greatest spiritual victories. And the reason is this. Um, yeah, yeah, they're really God's victories. How many know? They're really God's victories, but we're part of that. But the reason is this, because energy's down. You put out so much, you put out so much, and you're just down. And a lot of it happens on Mondays for me. So when we have the, the Sunday, we have the service, services, two services every Sunday, then we have the baptism, and I'm sure tomorrow is a, is a possibility, but I always look to defend myself. On, on that Sunday, we had the baptism service and stuff. That was a cool day. That was a great day, you know, when we see people baptized and coming to the Lord and coming to, and, and so um, that day, that Monday, I was, I kid you not, I was battling all day long. I was battling all day long. You know, I'm just stinking thinking, all sorts of stuff, and I knew the enemy was attacking me. And it wasn't until the next day that I felt the victory, felt the release of that. And one of the reasons it happens is because we let up. We've had the highs. And like I can say, all the weekends do that for me. Two services on Sundays. And today with, we're going to have the Living Waters Prayer Chapel dedication. That's going to be really cool. That's going to be awesome out there. And I know that tomorrow could be challenging. But I'm going to be looking for that. And that's what you need to do, too. When you have those moments, look for the challenge coming up to be prepared for that challenge. Another moment I had recently was with the Family Worship Center negotiation time all summer long. Gary and I have been working on it pretty diligently, and there was always something that seemed to cause a snag. Here's how I know the devil is concerned. The devil's not concerned about the vision that we have. You have a vision, you have a dream, you've been praying for the dream, you've, God called you to, whatever it is, here's how I know that the devil's concerned because the devil doesn't, he doesn't, he's not concerned about the vision, he's only concerned when you put your feet to the vision. Does that make sense? He's only concerned when you actually start living out the vision. So when God has a dream for you and you start putting your dream into action, expect the enemy to come and discourage you. Expect the enemy to come and give some disappointment to you. Expect the enemy to do it. Understand that we cram so much into our lives. And we cram, Americans, we get overwhelmed. You know, the majority of ski accidents in the ski slope, anywhere, uh, I read this about Colorado, but I think it's probably true, anywhere happened in the last hour because you're tired. Uh, you're tired in the last hour, you're very tired and you're overconfident. And that's the same with us spiritually. We have great victories, we're tired, and we get overconfident to that. Um, but understand, we just try as Americans cram so much into our lives, and we don't have enough space in our lives. We need more space in our lives. But not everything that is doable is sustainable. 
You just can't keep going that way. So Stephen Alardi wrote, who wrote Depression Cure said this, he said, we are never designed for the sedentary, we were never designed for sedentary, indoor, socially, uh, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. We were not designed for that. That's not how God designed. Our problem is that if we think if one is good, the two must be better, right? That we can do, in fact, here's what the Bible says. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and striving after wind. So we get this thing in America, if, if, if I can get one, and two is going to be better, right? If I have one aspirin, two is going to be better. If I have one dollar, two dollars is going to be better. If I have a hundred dollars, two hundred is going to be better. And so we work a double job. We work for this, we work for that, we work for this, we work for that. Are you guys catching any of this? Is this, is this resonating with anybody at all? Or is it just Tim blowing wind up here? Yeah, okay. So we, we do all this. So here's the second, real quick. Remember, Elijah said, it is, it is, um, I am not better than my ancestors. So number two is this. Um, your ancestors have nothing to do with this. Comparing ourselves with others. Elijah said, I am not better than my ancestors. He's comparing himself with others. Researchers say that says that the reason we're depressed is because we're looking over our shoulders at what, some, one of the reasons, at what someone else is doing and lo and behold, the enemy created this tool because we look at this, we're comparing ourselves, called social media. It sounds like I'm attacking social media, and I am. Sorry, Facebook, I know we're on there. Uh, so <laughs> but, but, but so and what's happened in social media? You, you're looking and say, oh, my friends had, had chili tonight for supper. That was great, you know? I don't need to know what people have for a meal. I don't need to know, it, but we want to know. I have a, Kathy's brother and sister-in-law are out west, and I, I wrote, put on there, they're showing, sending pictures that are really cool out west, they're in Glacier Park and places like that, and they're camping, and, and they're taking like six weeks and doing this trip, and just retired, and I just, I, I said, man, I, it's great that I can live vicariously through you, you know, and those are, those are good and stuff, but we can't be comparing ourselves to other people. The more, you know, you, you, comparison isn't good. In fact, Teddy Roosevelt said, comparison is a thief of joy. The more you wonder about what p other people have and what they're doing, the more it robs you of the joy that God wants to give you. Our authority is the Bible and the Holy Spirit working in our lives. In, the, in fact, Paul says this. He says, each one should test his own actions that he can take pride in himself, not comparing himself with somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Let me tell you something. You've got enough struggles on your own without comparing yourself to somebody else and adding more to yourself. It is not good. It's not healthy. Elijah was never going to stand before God for his ancestors. He was going to stand before God for his own calling, and you and I are in the same boat. So when it comes to TV, when it comes to social media, and all the things that invade your mind, maybe you want to try to Shut them off. Shut them off. I hear the gasps going on. But really, try, I dare you to go without social media after today's, after you watch today's message, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, dare, I, I challenge you to go without it for a week. Can you do that? Seriously, a good thing would be to practice, practice selective ignorance. You know, I choose not to watch the news all the time because there's some things that I don't need to know. There's a lot of people that feel like I need to know everything. You don't. Let me just tell you this right out. You don't need to know everything, right? Okay? You don't need to know it. There's some things you need to know, so a little bit of news is good, but I tell you what, silence is great. Disconnection is great. It is a good thing. So I'm going to be going on. I'm going to give you five more things next, or four more things next week. And then after that, we'll be looking at getting out of the cave. So let's.